Um, well, let me ask this. How would you like to, to do today? Do you want to just start with the tale of the three brothers or do you want to kind of shoot to the end and hit the high point, so to speak? It, either way, it's fine with me. Like I said, I've already posted a, a video lecture that's a little over two hours long that covers from about the middle of the book to the end. It pretty much hits a lot of the really important stuff. Any comments? Any ideas? Okay. Anybody else? Um, okay. It won't be the exact end. Go to um, the chapter of Malfoy Manor. You know, Harry, Ron, and Hermione, they get captured when they leave um, Xenophilus love goods. They go back off to the forest. They get captured. Just before they do, Hermione puts that spell on, on Harry. <laughs> and so he's unrecognizable. And at Malfoy Manor, we see Lucius especially, try to how do I want to put this? force Draco to identify the person with the hex as Harry, and Draco doesn't. He says, I don't know. He gets really close to Harry. He says, I don't know, and then walks away. And I think it's an interesting question because it's never definitively answered. Does Draco really recognize Harry and not give him up? Or does he really not know? Because as I said, it's, it's not definitively, definitively stated. We see a little bit after that, Dobby rescued them. But before that, Peter Pettigrew has that moment, like second, of the word that's used in the book is pity. It's not mercy. Of pity for Harry. And the silver hand that Voldemort gave him, you know, turns and kills him, all right? <clears throat> and then when they leave, we see our, what do you want to call this? Third great death, you know, not great in one sense, but you know, the first one is Hedwig, second one is Mad-Eye, and then we have Dobby. And notice how Dobby dies. We get this depiction of Dobby with his hands reaching out to Harry, we're told, in an attitude of supplication. Okay. Supplication is just a Latin word for prayer. And very briefly, chapter 24, the wand maker. Harry says, I'm going to bury Dobby, but not by magic. He says, I want to do it properly. Why is burying Dobby not by magic doing it properly? What does Harry mean by that? Why does it need to be manually? I mean, Dobby is Dobby is entirely a creature of the magical world. Harry is not. Harry didn't know anything about magic first 11 years of his life. Dobby's been magical from the moment he was born. So why wouldn't it be appropriate to just wave a wand and have him buried. There's not a clear answer to that. Okay? But I think one of the reasons is because of what Harry experiences while burying Dobby, while digging the grave. Notice we're told, probably about second page in, um, he dug with a kind of fury, relishing the manual work, glorying in the non-magic of it, for every drop of the sweat and every blister felt like a gift to the elf who had saved their lives. His scar burned, but he was master of the pain. In other words, Harry finally learns to do what he was instructed to do in book five. Learn self-control. And moreover, we're going to be told in that same paragraph, block out Voldemort. Now he can 
turn that on and off. He can allow Voldemort in, or he can see what Voldemort's thinking, or he can turn it off, right? What else happens? While he's doing the digging, all of these disparate pieces in his mind, all of these disparate ideas start to kind of, like a giant jigsaw puzzle, fall into place. Things start to make sense. In other words, the problem that he had at the beginning of the novel to choose what to believe is no longer a problem. He chooses to believe Dumbledore. Why? Because he starts to see the little connections. What before had been disparate points, he now sees these are connected. And he thinks, if Dumbledore knew, for example, about Peter Pettigrew, what else did he know? If he knew about, you know, my need to be a seeker, not a knower, what else did he know? All right? So, a few more pages in, after he actually buries Dobby, Harry tells Bill, I need to talk to Griphook and all of it. Why does he need to talk to all of it? What's he need to find out from him? Okay, what else? How do you become master of the Elder One? Do you have to kill? And Ollivander's like, not necessarily. I mean, there's no handbook. How do you use the Elder One kind of thing? But he says, not necessarily. Not necessarily. You have to defeat the previous owner. Okay, what does he need to learn from Griphook? What is in Gringotts? So, okay, Gryffindor sword, the thought, the real sword? Or is it the one they got out of the pond? No, the real sword was gotten out of the pond. It's the locket. The Lestranges have a vault, and there's a locket. Uh, not a locket. Not the locket. Um, the thank you. The cup. Okay. So, Harry, at the end of that chapter, tells Ron and Hermione what he's now come to understand. And Ron says, where's Voldemort now? He's just about at Hogwarts. Let's go, right? Because they can operate, be there instantly. Harry, no. No, I'm not supposed to go after the Deathly Hallows. It's all about the Horcruxes again, right? And what does he do? He physically does something that indicates his submission to the plan. He falls down on his knees, okay? indicating humility. He's not, what does he really want to do? He wants to go get the wand. And we're told, the end of that chapter, now take that back, beginning of chapter 25, Shell Cottage, second paragraph. He could not remember ever before choosing not to act, right? We could go back to book one. Oh, you know, not quite his first day at Hogwarts, but really soon thereafter, when he first learns how to fly, what do we see Harry do? He goes after Malfoy to get Neville's Remembrance. Why? Because he can. He chooses to act. Forbidden Forest, he stops Malfoy from going forward. And all throughout the remaining books, he's always acting. That's why Hermione tells him in book five, Harry, you got the savior complex. Okay? And now... He's choosing instead to remain passive. He's not going to act. He's going to let Voldemort get it. Does Harry know, I mean, conclusively, 100% know right now that it doesn't matter if Voldemort gets the wand? Mm, not quite sure about that. I think he's pretty sure. Okay. So, let's 
skip a bunch. They go to Gringotts, they get the cup. They, we have the, you know, universal ride with the uh, dragon and everything. And they arrive back to Hogsmeade. Okay. They show up at um, the Hogshead. Who's the owner slash bartender? Aberforth Dumbledore. Dumbledore's little brother. That's the flash of blue eye that Harry saw in the mirror. He thought it was Dumbledore. It was a Dumbledore. It wasn't the one he thought it was. Okay? And he gets to talking to him, and Aberforth tries to convince Harry to save himself. Talks about what a jerk his brother was. Talks about, you know, the Order of the Phoenix, Phoenix being finished, done, kaput. Why? Because the Phoenix is dead. Dumbledore, you know. Harry argues, I can't. I've got to go on. I've got a job to finish, et cetera, et cetera. This is somewhere around 562, 563. Harry kept quiet. He did not want to express the doubts and uncertainties about Dumbledore that had riddled him for months now. He had made his choice while he dug Dobby's grave. He had decided to continue along the winding, dangerous path indicated for him by Dumbledore to accept. He had not been told everything but he, that he wanted to know, but simply to trust. He's chosen what to believe. He's chosen to believe Dumbledore. Notice, is it a 1 plus 1 equals 2 kind of thing? not. He doesn't know how it ends. Okay. So, who else starts to show up? Well, a couple more pages on. 567, 568. Before we do, who else shows up? Aberforth again says, in response to Hermione's, Dumbledore loved Harry. Why didn't he tell him to hide this? Aberforth says. Why didn't he say to him, take care of yourself. Here's how to survive. I mean, it's a pretty good question. You would think if a loved one is in danger, you would tell that person how to protect him or herself. Harry says, because sometimes you've got to think about more than your own safety. Sometimes you've got to think about the greater good. This is war. What does Harry mean? You've got to think about the greater good. Louder? It's bigger than just Harry and his life. We hear all that we, we hear this all the time around us. That is, we hear it in political talk. You've got to get involved in something more than just yourself. Part of a cause, part of a movement kind of thing. You've got to think about more than just what's good for you, okay? This is Harry saying that. But what does he mean, though? When he finishes it with, this is war. You don't go to war for yourself. You go to war for what? For those that are behind. You know, World War II. All those men who joined up and were drafted went off for what purpose? To protect what was left behind. I mean, think of what Aragorn says at the Council of Elrond about the riders of the north and how they protect the Shire. They keep the Shire and everything safe. Okay? What Harry's implying is when you think about others, what might happen to yourself? Well, Mad Eye shows us that. Dobby shows us that. Let's jump to the end. Fred shows us that. Lupin shows us that. Tonks shows us that. You know, the first order of the Phoenix, half of them died. Okay. So we start seeing people come through, you know. 
the mirror and such. And who's one of those who shows up? Who that has been separated from his family because of his actions? Percy. Percy. Percy shows back up. Percy apologizes. Fred and George welcome him. Notice, they don't beat him down for it. They say, we knew you'd come to your senses. Okay? So, what's the lost diadem? It's a horcrux. Belonged to Rowena Ravenclaw. And what other little backstory do we get? Who's the ghost that nearly Headless Dick is afraid of? And, and why would a ghost be afraid of another ghost? How can you hurt? How can it hurt you if you're already dead, right? Okay, but who is the ghost that nearly Headless Dick is afraid of? The Bloody Baron. Why is he bloody? And he wears his chains as a mark of penance, we're told. Okay? So, in the chapter, The Sacking of Severus Snape, just a couple pages in, Harry apparates into Hogwarts, or he goes into Hogwarts, and he sees one of the Caro twins spit at McGonagall. He's got the invisibility cloak on. And what does he do? takes the cloak off, and he uses the Crucianus curse on the Caro twin. McGonagall's like, Harry, that's a stupid thing to do. And he's like, but he's spared you. What's Harry showing? Now, McGonagall uses the term, how very gallant of you, gallant of you. What's that mean? Chivalry. She couldn't defend herself right then and there at that point. But Harry sure as hell could. And she's like, oh. right? She knows it's dangerous for Harry to be there. We see the sacking of Severus Snape. Okay? We get the Battle of Hogwarts. Uh, where we hear about Helena Ravenclaw and such. And the Battle of Hogwarts ends with. We've already seen one Weasley injured in this war, right? St. George. George has had his ear blasted off. And we hear someone shouting, no, 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 Fred, no. Percy was shaking his brother. Ron was kneeling beside him. And Fred's eyes stared without seeing the ghost of his last laugh still etched upon his face. And then notice the very next sentence, next chapter. The world had ended. So why had the battle not ceased? The castle fallen silent in horror, and every combatant laid down their arms. What's, what's that mean, the world had ended? I mean, obviously it's not literal. For Harry, a world without Fred Weasley, it's like anti-reality. It cannot be conceived of. But then, another body falls. In other words, Harry's jarred back into reality. Okay? So, go on a little bit more in that chapter. And Harry follows Snape around 6.55. He follows Snape to where Voldemort is. And we see the nice little interview between Voldemort and Snape. Okay. And what does Voldemort say just before he sicks the snake Nagini onto Snape. I regret it. 
around two pages later. Yeah, about 6.57 or so. Does he? Is Voldemort capable of regret? Because what does regret imply? If you regret doing something, what is that saying about your emotional state? You're sorry for it, right? If you're sorry for it, that implies what? Oops, I made a mistake. Not true. <laughs> so, Voldemort leaves. Snape grabs hold of Harry, holds him by the robes, says, take it, take it, Sorry. and this stuff comes from his mouth and ears and eyes. Harry knew what it was, but didn't know what to do. Hermione conjures a flask, and Harry puts it in. And what are Snape's last words? Look at me. Why? And go one more step. How does he want to die? Looking into Lily's eyes. We don't know that at this point, though. We don't know that until we read all of The Prince's Tale. Okay? So... Voldemort offers Harry an option. It's kind of a single combat thing. Harry Potter, come out. I'll give you an hour. You can take care of your dead and wounded. And if Harry Potter comes out and meets me in the Forbidden Forest, nobody else need die. But if he doesn't, I'm going to rain hell on everybody. Okay? So Harry runs up to Headmaster's office, finds the pensive, Dumps the memory in, and what do we see? It's not just a single memory, right? It's like a long recording. Beginning where? How old is Snape? In the earliest part of the memory. Nine or ten. Who else shows up? Lily Evans. When Harry heard Aunt Petunia say at the beginning of book five, in response to Vernon's water dements wallops, you know, Petunia says they guard the wizard prison Azkaban. I heard that filthy boy talking about them. We all assume at that point she's talking about who? James. She's not. She's talking about Snape. Because what else do we learn? Petunia wanted to go to Hogwarts. The reason she hated her sister was because she was jealous of her sister. Okay? So, we get a whole bunch of other stuff. We find out Snape's been protecting Harry all along. Okay? We hear Dumbledore tell Snape at one point in the memory, I don't have the page marked. Why don't I have the page number marked? Um, around 674, 675 maybe, when Snape's begging with Dumbledore to keep James and Lily safe and such, Dumbledore says she and James, Lily and James, put their faith in the wrong person, right? who they put their faith in? Who was their secret keeper? It wasn't Dumbledore. It wasn't Sirius. It wasn't Lupin. It was Peter Pettigrew. Rather like you, Severus. Notice, they put their faith in the wrong person. They showed Malfoy. Bad faith. Mal Foy. Okay. Snape says, I wish I was dead. Dumbledore, what use would that be to anybody? If you love Lily Evans, your way forward is clear. You gotta help protect your son. Okay. 
So they keep talking. What do we discover in the memory? What happened at the beginning of the school year? Why is Dumbledore's hand, why was Dumbledore's hand withered? Keep going. He attempted to break the ring and released a curse. So when Dumbledore was at the lightning struck tower in book six, two things were working against him there. What were they? He had drunk the potion, right? That was in the basin in the cave. And the curse that he released on his hand. And if the potion didn't kill him, the curse would. So when the book opens, unbeknownst to us, what is already happening to Albus Dumbledore? He's already dying. Okay? So that when he tells Snape here, you know, when Snape brings to him the unbreakable vow, when he tells Snape, you've got to do it, better you kill me than that Draco do what? Split his soul in two. Snape says, what about my soul, Dumbledore? What about mine? How does Dumbledore reply? He says, only you know what will happen to your soul. What's the implication of that? Will Snape be, according to what Dumbledore implies, will Snape be murdering Dumbledore. No, because he asked him to. And what is it? What is Snape's killing of Dumbledore? When Dumbledore says Severus, please, please. Bingo. He's begging for a mercy. Because how's he going to die otherwise? Or otherwise? It's going to be painful. Because he's Dying from the curse, and he's dying from the poison. Okay? He's essentially asking for euthanasia, to be euthanized. Put me out of my misery. Okay? Whether whatever one you know thinks about that. So we finally get to it. The part of Voldemort that lives inside Harry, it's that that gives him the power of speech with snakes, connection with Voldemort's mind, blah 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 blah. That has got to what? That's got to die. How can that part of Voldemort that's in Harry die? Okay. And Harry has to die how? <laughs> that's the important part. He's got to die by Voldemort. Okay. Snake, so the boy must die and Voldemort must do it. And what does Snape finally say? You've been fattening him like a pig all this time. Remember what Harry thought at the beginning of this novel? I don't want to be a tool. It's exactly what he is. Okay? We see Snape do Expecto Patronum in the memory. And what comes out? The Silver Dove. Forest again. Harry goes into the forest. He starts to go into the forest. We're told. Harry understood at last that he was not supposed to survive. His job was to walk calmly to death's welcoming arms. Along the way, he was to dispose of Voldemort's remaining links to life. So that when at last he flung himself across Voldemort's path, did not raise a wand to defend himself, the end would be clean. And the job that ought to have been done in Goddard's Hollow would be finished. Neither would live neither could survive. Okay. That's what Harry thinks should have happened in Godric's Hall. Okay. And we're told, one, two, three, four paragraphs down from that. Middle of the paragraph. As he sets up and gets prepared to walk out. 
Why had he never appreciated what a miracle he was? Brain and nerve and bounding heart. See, this is getting at the idea that we were told the morning after Christmas morning, the defeat and Batilda bag shots. When we're told, Harry's sitting there, he's looking out over this beautiful view, and it should have been the most amazing thing. And instead, he feels like an insect in front of an uncaring universe. Dumbledore's betrayal was almost nothing. Of course, there was a bigger plan, blah, blah, blah. Okay? So, he starts to make his way down. He sees Neville. He says, hey, Neville, if you ever see Voldemort's snake, kill it. Because he knows that's one. Okay? That's a horcrux. He overhears Ginny because he's got the invisibility cloak on. She can't see him. Notice he doesn't stop, give her a peck on the cheek or anything. Just walks right by. He's going to make his way to the forest. And we're told around, I don't know, 695 or so, he and Voldemort and Snape, the abandoned boys, had all found home here. Notice, Harry links himself with these other two. Why? Had Harry known love growing up? No, no, really. Did Snape? Apparently not. And Voldemort sure as hell didn't. Okay? He identifies with them because we're told it's only at Hogwarts that he found home. He keeps going on. Here's the mentors. And he's like, man, I, I, I can't face the Dementors. Why? We're told he had no strength left for Patronus. Is that true or false? And I'm, I'm not trying to say that, you know, our narrator is unreliable or anything like that. What does he lack, really, to be able to create a Patronus? What must you think of? Your happy thought. This is why I think that's, you know, the, the biggest flaw almost in her writing. You know, it's a Disney-esque, you know, pixie dust and dust and, you know, stuff. But what's his happy thought? How's he going to come up with a happy thought? Uh, you know, I'll see Jenny again? No, <laughs> he's walking to his death. Every second he breathed, the smell of the grass, the cool on his face was so precious to think that people had years and years, time to waste, so much time it dragged, and he was clinging to each second. You could almost say that is the point entirely of all the books. How so? Harry has to learn, we're going to find out in the next, yeah, next chapter. Harry has to learn to master death. What does that mean? To be prepared for it. How do you be prepared for it? Not by worrying about it, not by running away from it, not by fearing it, but by living each moment like what? Like it's your last. Bingo. Like it is your very last. I mean, none of us know when our last breath is. We think we do. We kind of, or we might kind of think, you know, I'm young, your ages. I've got 40, 60, whatever years left. My age, I've got 20, maybe 30 at most, maybe 10, you know, years left. None of us knows. We all know, well, maybe you don't. I've known people who have literally dropped dead with no indication. That they were ill. My father-in-law, you know, the, literally got a call one day out of nowhere. Mike's dead. Just had a massive stroke, standing at his kitchen counter, <clears throat> dead before he hit the ground. Sixty-eight years old, no indication of heart disease, anything. Okay, other people, you know, little kids, and no time is guaranteed. All right? So, 
He's walking towards it. He puts his hand in his robe. He pulls out the snitch. I open it to close. Harry's thinking, well, this is the close. This is the ending. The door's... And he puts his lips to it and says, I'm about to die. And it magically opens. It hadn't opened before. And there's the resurrection stone with a crack representing the wand. And all of a sudden, who's beside him? James, Lily, Sirius, Lupin. Had he seen Lupin die? He asks, does it hurt? Sirius, dying? Not at all. Quicker and easier than falling asleep. Lupin, and he'll want it to be quick. He wants it over. Harry, I didn't want you to die. He's talking to Lupin there. Why did he tell Lupin, imply, that Lupin shall go back to Tonks? Because he wanted him to live. And instead, Lupin dies and Tonks dies and the epilogue, the final word, takes us what? Takes us full circle from the very beginning of the first novel. Because what do we end with? We end with an orphaned baby whose parents died defying Lord Voldemort. We end with little Teddy Lupin who's kind of like the new Harry Potter, so to speak. So, he goes on. Voldemort zaps him. And we see King's Cross. He lay face down, listening to the silence. He was perfectly alone. Nobody was watching. Nobody was there. A long time later, or maybe no time at all, it came to him, he must exist. Must be more than be disembodied thought because he was lying. Definitely lying on some surface. That is, he had sensory perception. And almost soon as they reached this conclusion, he became aware he was naked. Notice what happens. Notice the progression of ideas. He first has consciousness. Then he realizes He's physically prone. He's lying flat. And because he realizes he's physically prone, he realizes, I've got a body. Next thing he realizes, my body's naked. I don't have any clothes on. Okay? But it doesn't bother him. You know, it's just kind of intriguing. Why am I naked? He wondered whether, as he could feel, he would be able to see. Because all of this is happening with his eye closed. He opens his eyes. He lay in a bright mist. That is, he doesn't see anything but a bright mist or a haze. His surroundings, notice, were not hidden by cloudy vapor. Rather, the cloudy vapor had not yet formed into surroundings. Even what he's lying on doesn't look like a floor. Okay? It was simply there, a flat blank, something on which to be. He sat up. His body appeared unscathed. Now, notice, he should have what on the back of his right hand? I must not tell lies. He should also have on his forearm scarred from when he dug his fingernails in earlier in the book. He is not wearing glasses. But he can see. See, before, when he loses his glasses, everything's a blur. Now he's not wearing glasses, and he can see perfectly. What are we being told? What is this, or where is this? Or in what state is Harry? First of all, 
He is dead. He is dead. It's not mostly dead. It's not nearly dead. He's dead. Even though Dumbledore's going to say something that's going to apply maybe a little bit different. He hears a noise. A pitiful noise. Slightly indecent. Indecent means it doesn't fit in this surrounding. There's a problem with it. Okay? And suddenly, because he hears this noise, he wishes he were clothed. Why? Because if somebody else is around here, I don't want him seeing me naked. And, boom! Robes appear a short distance away. He puts them on. So notice, now, there's not only perception of the place he's in, but there's a perception of distance. It's three-dimensional. Okay? Was he in some great room of requirement? Maybe it was a palace. He hears the noise again. He thinks this is kind of like the Great Wall. The only, he was the only person there except for he recoils. He sees the thing that's making the noise. It had the form of a small naked child curled on the ground, its skin raw and rough, flayed looking. You know what flayed is? It had the skin pulled off. There was a torture that was used in the ancient world. Okay? And it lay shuddering under a seat where it had been left unwanted, stuffed out of sight, struggling for breath. What is that? That's the piece of Voldemort. What piece of Voldemort? That's the piece of Voldemort's soul that was in Harry. Notice, though, it's struggling. It's still alive in the sense that Harry is still alive. In the sense, because Harry's dead, and this thing is dead. But notice, Harry's afraid of it. He did not want to approach it, but he goes closer to it. Soon he stood near enough to touch it, but could not bring himself to do it. He felt like a coward. He ought to comfort it, but it repulsed him. Why does he think he should comfort it? Patronus Potter. Harry always wants to help, and he's told, you cannot help. Why can't he help it? Because it's dead. It looks alive, it's dead. He spins around and there's Dumbledore. Harry, you're dead. Mm, yes, and I'm dead too. Mm, that's the question, isn't it? On the whole, dear boy, I think not. Why not? According to Dumbledore's reasoning, why isn't Harry dead? Do we get explicitly told? No. There's still a bit of Harry, however, where? In Voldemort. When Voldemort used Harry's blood to bring himself back to physical bodily strength, he created essentially a horcrux, not a real one, but a metaphorical one. It's that that is keeping Harry alive. It's that part of Harry that's still alive, okay? The rest of Harry is dead. And notice, Harry raises his hand and the scar isn't The scar exists where? In the physical world. Harry isn't in the physical world. This is after death. This is in the spiritual world. 
Where is he in that spiritual world? This is the place nearly headless Nick arrived at. But what did nearly headless Nick not do? He didn't go on. Instead, he went back. He chose his pale imitation of life, which is why he can do this and pull his head most of the way off. Okay? So, Harry says, explain, Dumbledore, you already know. Harry, I let him kill me, didn't I? You did. So the part of his soul that was in me, it's gone? Oh, yes. Yes. He destroyed it. Your soul is whole and completely your own, Harry. It's whole. It, that's why there's no scar. That's why he can see perfectly. This is Harry kind of redeemed, if you want. This is Harry perfected, okay? But then, what's that? Something that is beyond either of our help. Uh, but if Voldemort killed me, how can I be alive? Come on, come on, Harry, think. He took my blood, ah, precisely. He took your blood, rebuilt his living body. I live while he lives, Harry. But I, I thought it was the other way around. Okay. By the way, how many Horcruxes did Voldemort make? Dumbledore thought there were six. When he talks with Harry, there were actually seven Horcruxes, which means how many pieces of Voldemort's soul are there? There are eight. If seven is the perfect number, the one in his body, okay, and then the other six, that makes seven, then eight is pretty much the opposite. Any number other than seven is the opposite. If seven is perfection and completeness, any other number is imperfection, incompleteness. Okay? So, Dumbledore says, you were the seventh Horcrux, Harry, the Horcrux he never meant to make, etc., etc. They keep talking. They talk about the Deathly Hallows. Dumbledore says, page 719 or so, you know, after searching for the Deathly Hallows, he realized, I had learned I was not to be trusted with How many times was he offered the position of Minister of Magic? He says in that conversation with Tom Riddle, three times. That's three times up until that point. We don't know how many other times after that. Okay. Harry, you've been much better than Fudge or Scringer, would I? I've proven as a very young man the power with my weakness and my temptation. It's a curious thing, Harry, but perhaps those who are best suited to power are those who have never sought it. Who's the new Minister of Magic? Kingsley Shockable. Did he seek the job? No. This is, a, I, you know, I, I can't help but think of this and think politics. Somebody who spends all their life wanting to run for president, that's a pretty good indication you shouldn't kind of choose that person, okay? So, he goes on, tells Harry he's the true master of death because he doesn't seek to run away from death. Okay. Harry, last page. If you planned your death with Snape, you meant him to end up with the Elder Wand, didn't you? Yeah, that, mm -hmm, that was it. Who got the Elder Wand? How? He did expel Yormus at the top of the tower. But yet, where was the Elder Wand put? In the tomb with Dumbledore. So how Draco didn't physically have possession of it. But we're told the Wand knows who the owner is. Who has physical possession of the Wand now? Voldemort does. Voldemort thinks, ah, Snape is the one who killed Dumbledore. Snape, therefore, is the master of the Wand. Harry, 
I've got to go back, haven't I? It's up to you. Wait, I've got a choice? Of course. If you decided not to go back, you would be able to say, board a train. That is, go on. Where would it take me? On. <laughs> Voldemort's got the Elder One. Yep, that's true. He does. You want me to go back. I think if you choose to return, there's a chance he may be finished for good. Cannot promise it. I know this, Harry. You have less to fear from returning here than he does. Notice, Dumbledore doesn't say, Harry, you're now going to live forever. You're going to die again. Okay? Harry looks at the thing under the seat. And notice, Dumbledore, ever the Legilimens, knows what Harry's thinking. Do not pity the dead, Harry. Don't pity that part of Voldemort. Don't pity your parents. Don't pity Lupin or Sirius. Pity the living and above all, those who live without love. By returning, you may ensure that fewer souls are made, fewer families torn apart. Now, the second part kind of implies, if you go back, you can save the world, Harry. But what's the first part? Pity the living and those who live without love. Who's he talking about? Voldemort. Show pity on Voldemort. Why? Harry goes back. He wakes up. Narcissa lies to Voldemort. Okay. And we get... Page 738, when Harry says, you won't be killing anybody else tonight. You don't get it, do you? I was ready to die to stop you hurting these people, but you did not. Harry, no, but I meant to, and that's what did it. Did what? How did Harry live when Voldemort first cursed him, when he was one year old? His mother went in front of him and protected him. What has Harry done by going into the forest? He goes in front of Voldemort to protect everybody behind him. He does become the chosen one. Okay? He says, they're protected from you. See, all those who died up until that point, yeah, they really died. They're not coming back. But after that point, Harry says, you, you can't kill any of them. Okay? And so what does Harry offer him? A second chance. What does he tell Voldemort to do? He says... Harry says, try for a little remorse. I'm trying to find the spot. I've got so much under that. Try for a little remorse. Be a man. Okay? And he's like, how dare you? Yep, I dare. And how's it finish? Avada Kedavra, and Harry uses uncommon skill and power. Expelliarmus. Okay? And Voldemort's spell rebounds on him. Last minute, and look what happens. Tom Riddle dies. So, paragraph, I don't have the page. Paragraph that begins, I don't know, four or five pages before the end of that chapter. So you say 72, 71, somewhere around 469, 470. Uh, 669, 670, something like that. The sun rose steadily over Hogwarts. The Great Hall blazed with light and life. Harry was an indispensable part of the Greek. They wanted him there with him, their leader and symbol, their savior, their guide. He had not slept. He craved the company of only a few of them. Okay? And what happens? The sun rises, and we get this description of the red and gold. 
Griffin are colors, obviously, but also what? Phoenix colors, it's the rebirth. It's the new beginning, okay? Um, all right, that's a minute over time. If you want, by no means do you have to, but I did post that lecture that covers this material in a lot more detail. Um, that is on both in your email on the and on the announcements page.